All righty, mate. Well, welcome to episode 66 of the Exponential Performance Podcast. It's so good to have you here. In this week's episode, we're talking about things you need to consider when you're getting into the gym as the first time for an endurance athlete or if you've had a bit of a break from the gym. Nick's going to dig into mindset and goal setting. We also take a look at vitamin D supplementation, which at this time of the year, winter in New Zealand or the Southern Hemisphere is really important. So without further ado, let's get into it. Welcome to the Exponential Performance Podcast. Join sports scientist and performance coach Matty Graham to find out how to train smarter and maximize your performance no matter who you are. Alrighty, mate. Welcome to episode 66. It's so good to have you here. I hope your training has been going well. Uh, and I hope you enjoyed the new format for the podcast in the last episode. We're focusing on providing a slightly more uh, time-condensed podcast so that we can sort of concentrate the amount of information that we're giving you so that you don't have to listen to unnecessary chit-chat around uh, around the topics that we're covering and rather than sort of weaving our way through one or two topics over a 45 minute to an hour podcast we're trying to condense things make them a little bit more shorter a little bit more sharper so that we can give you uh, lots of good content so that you can train hard but most importantly you can train smarter so we are going to crack straight into it uh, and today I just want to kick things off talking about getting back into the gym if you've been out of the gym for a while or getting into the gym if it's your sort of first experience as an endurance athlete getting into the gym. And this is sort of timely for me and the reason I want to sort of bring it up is that I've had this conversation with about three or four people over the last couple of weeks. It's that time of the year where endurance athletes are you know, either in the gym now over winter or they're starting to think "Mm, maybe I should go and do something in the gym so if it is your first time in the gym or it's the first time in a while the key things we really want to avoid is a prolonged muscle soreness or delayed onset muscle soreness after the gym session and the reason we want to avoid this is that it's going to interfere with our training in our other sports specific disciplines so if you've got really sore legs or really sore upper body you're not going to be able to paddle well you're not going to be able to ride or run very well not going to be able to swim well because of that soreness so that's counterproductive to our overall training load if we're not actually able to do our sports specific training because we're sore from our gym work then again that's counterproductive so what can we do to avoid that and make sure that we're getting the most out of our gym training well the first couple of sessions i think people go into them thinking that they need to be hurting themselves in the gym they need to be pushing really hard to chase those sore muscles that delayed onset muscle soreness or they need to go in there uh, and they need to work really hard and to, and to sweat and to burn. And I mentioned it in the episode uh, where we interviewed Dougal Allen about strength training, about if you're in the gym as an endurance athlete, you want to be chasing the sort of opposite feeling to what you get out on the bike or running or kayaking or whatever your sport is. So if you're out running and you're huffing and puffing and sweating, then we want to avoid that sort of feeling in the gym because those little signs from our body tell us that we've got quite a high metabolic conditioning load. We've got a large aerobic sort of training effect happening. If we're getting a large aerobic training effect in the gym, then it's just general non-specific aerobic conditioning, which which is not as good as specific aerobic conditioning say, out in the real world doing our sport. So we want to avoid that. In the gym, what we're looking for is a strength effect. We're looking at developing strength, whether that be uh, sort of accessory strength in our stabilizing muscles to, to contribute towards our sport performance indirectly, 
or whether that's gross strength development in those key prime mover muscles that are going to directly help our sport performance. Whatever one of those two strength gains that we're looking for, none of them require a lot of huffing and puffing and sweating. Sure, you're going to get a little bit out of breath. Sure, you're going to get, start to get warm, but you shouldn't be in a sweating, puffing mess on the floor when you're in the gym. So keep in mind that, first off, we're not chasing those uh, those same feelings that we're getting when we're out training in our sport. So going into the gym with that in mind, that it is going to feel different and it should feel kind of easy, or at least that's how a lot of endurance athletes describe it. It feels easy compared to what they usually do out in the boat or on the bike or, or running. So keep that in mind when you first step into the gym. The second thing is, is I want you to do a lot less than you think you can. A lot of people, when I had someone in the gym the other day, first time back, and we were getting through uh, their program, and we were only doing two sets of everything, rather than the, the usual three or four sets that we usually do with them in the gym. And they said, oh, is that all we're doing today? So as, as That was kind of like a negative thing. Is that all we're doing? And I said, yes, that is all we're doing, because that's all that we need to do to get the adaptation that we're after. So if we were to do the, you know, the usual sets, let's say three to four sets, it gives them an adaptation to get what they're after. Anything on top of that is not actually adding because we've already flicked the light switch, so to speak, to turn the lights on to get those strength gains. Anything after that is just general damage to the muscles, which is going to leave you sore afterwards. So once you've done the required amount, the minimal effective dose, uh, so to speak, and that's potentially something that we could talk about uh, in future episodes, once you've done that, there's no point doing any more because it's not actually adding to the outcome that we're after. It's just having a counterproductive outcome to it. So doing less than you think that you should be doing is probably a good level to start at. And so that when you walk out the door after your gym session, you're feeling fresh, you're feeling better than when you walked in, and you're ready to come back in one or two days' time for another one. You're not going to be crippled for like six days because you've done such a you know a massive session. And I liken this getting back into any training if you've had a little bit of time off or if you uh, are getting into training for a specific event for the first time. If you can imagine, you wouldn't go out for your first ever run and go and run a half marathon. And that's the same as going into a, into the gym and jumping straight into a really big training session in the gym. Okay, You're going to do one of them. It's going to leave you sore, potentially overworked, potentially injured. When you're building up your running, you start small and you focus on regular, consistent training sessions to develop that capacity. And then you build up you know, to that 21K run or whatever it is you're building up to. You don't jump straight into it. And the same with the gym. It's about progressing your strength work over time and over sessions. So the sessions become more demanding as you go. A lot of people have you know, strength, 60 minutes on their program, let's say, or they've always done a, a 60 minute strength session or that's just what they do. So they think they've got to go to the gym first time back or first time ever and do 60 minutes. I'm just going to keep going until the 60 minutes is up. Whereas in fact, you get away with a lot less than that. And the other thing is, is just people having a flick through Instagram and seeing exercises that look really cool, and no doubt that they do look awesome. But then they go into the gym and, all right, I've got to do this exercise, I've got to do this exercise, I've got to do this one and this one and that one and this one. Rather than actually focusing on what their, their key outcome is and how they're going to get there. So all of this encompasses, I guess, is getting some sort of a plan together to work towards what you are doing. A lot of people drift into the gym not sort of knowing that it's important for their endurance performance, uh, 
but not really knowing exactly what they're going to be doing once they're in there. So highly recommend getting a plan, one that's tailored to you, um, but just a general plan if you cannot get something that is tailored to you uh, specifically. So just remember what you're doing in the gym is more than just a one-off session. You know, we're not just going to go to the gym once and do everything that we can ever think of and then we're going to walk out of it good. No, we need to build up over time. We need to add variety into that program. We need to add progressive uh, loading into that, both in terms of movement complexity and then also actual physical uh, resistive load that we are lifting. So that there is a bit of an outline for those people that are venturing into the gym this winter or people that are venturing into the gym for the first time, don't go and smash yourself first off. Give yourself some time to adapt, build up into it so that you can get the most out of it and it can have the most positive effect on your real-world performance. Nick, any thoughts on that? Yeah, one thing that oh, I guess I see or hear in, um, about through various jobs and gyms is, is technique. Uh, oh, now, yeah. Like you said, it's, it's really easy to jump on Instagram or the websites and, okay, I'm going to do these five exercises. They're supposed to look like this because that's what the guy in the video or the lady in the video looks like. And you go out there and you're like, oh, I think this is working. You know, I'm doing a deadlift. I'm feeling it in my back. Yeah, I think that's good. You know, so A, know what the exercise should look like um, and maybe even get, get some assistance from a, a gym instructor or, or um, some sort of trainer to start with, so you get those fundamental movement patterns of a squat, a deadlift, you know, things like prone holds, you know, how many times do you see people sort of prone hold with their butt sticking right up in the air, and they think, oh, yeah, yeah, I can do a prone hold for four minutes, and, you know, you get them to, to bring their hips down so they're, they're almost flat, and their back's flat, and they can't hold it for 30 seconds, because mm. they're not actually working the right muscles, so, yeah, so, so know your technique, and know what muscle groups you're supposed to be feeling certain exercises in, um, and then know too where you think your plan might go. So like you said, Matty, you're not going to jump in and do max squats on day one of your program. But if that's your end goal to increase your max squat for whatever purpose, then you need to have your sort of progressive overload tailoring towards the key outcomes that you want. Um, you know, spending all day on the bench press um, and on the bicep curls is very non-specific for, for someone, especially like a cyclist, let's say. Um, Absolutely. Uh, and I like that idea as well between like uh, doing the exercise, let's say it's the prone hold, for example. Uh, so you're just going through the motion almost and potentially your technique's not great. But then there's the concept of actually, you know, doing the exercise uh, and really recruiting what you're meant to be doing and getting that sort of mind muscle connection and getting the most out of an exercise. Mm. Because, you know, you can have uh, two people side by side, let's say we're doing um lunges for example one person and they kind of look the same from the outside almost both of them are doing the lunge movement pattern they kind of look the same but they can have two very different sort of uh, inputs into what they're doing one person is just sort of stepping out not really doing anything other person every lunge that they do you know there's really good knee tracking they're really focusing on developing that you know, internal pressure through their through their core, through their trunk, uh, and they're really engaged with the movement. They're not just going through the motion, they're actually doing, you know, the movement. Mm. Yeah, <clears throat> and I think too, people get so caught up on, in my sort of, my background, people get so caught up on doing core, you know, got to mm. be doing half an hour of core all the time. And if you're doing, doing the big prime movers, you know, you're squatting, you're deadlifting, your core should be activated all the time. Mm. So you're doing these big prime movements with your core activated, you're strong, you're solid, and that's actually giving you a core workout at the same time. So you don't have to go and be able to do a prone hold for 10 minutes to, to be a top cyclist or a top runner. It may be yeah. beneficial for your sport, um, but in most cases it's probably not. So as long as you can have your core activated while you're actually moving in your sport, uh, that would be something to don't have to spend half an hour each session in the, in the core max at the end of the gym. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So there we go, team. A few points for if you're venturing into the gym. Uh, biggest one is get a plan and get some help. We do have some strength training plans available, but 
we're not always going to be there to be able to help you with them. So I'd highly recommend, even if you do have a strength plan, uh, whoever it's from, getting some eyes on you in the gym just for those minor corrections, uh, helping with that recruitment and just nailing that technique is super important. So jump into that. Now, Nick is going to take us into our series that is going to be running over the next few episodes. Last time we looked at mindset and positive thinking. Today's Nick is going to expand on mindset and goal setting. Nick, take us away. Cool. So, yeah, as Matty said, we're going to look around sort of goal setting, but also around the motivation and, and what drives us to do what we like to do. And I often like to think motivation is simply, why do you get out of bed each morning? So I found a, a quite an interesting definition of motivation from the psycho, uh, Psychology Today website, and they define it as the ability to initiate and persist at a task. They carry on to say, to perform at your best, you must want to begin the process of developing as an athlete and you must be willing to maintain your efforts until you have achieved your goals. Motivation in sports is so important because you must be willing to work hard in the face of fatigue, boredom, pain, and the desire to do other things. Motivation will impact everything that influences your sports, performance, physical conditioning, technical and tactical training, mental preparation, and general lifestyle, including sleep, diet, school, work, and relationships. So it's quite a comprehensive definition, and it really is sort of saying that motivation is the key to everything. You know, if you're not motivated to do something, you're not going to do it to the either the best of your abilities, or you're not going to do it at all. So I often think a quite a good example of that is on a you know come a Friday afternoon, uh, you get the call out to go hang out with your mates, maybe have a beer or a bowl of chips, uh, but you've got a big race on Saturday. If your motivation for that race is high enough, then you will say no. If your motivation is not high enough or it's not in the right ways, which we'll talk about shortly, then it's really easy to get sidetracked and think, oh, I'll go, I'll go have a couple of beers and a, a bowl of chips. So, like I said, without, without the motivation to do a task, it's unlikely it's going to happen. Um, now, there are two types of motivation, uh, one of them being extrinsic and one of them being intrinsic. Now, probably the easiest way to think about those two is extrinsic being external and intrinsic being internal to us. So extrinsic motivations are everything that comes from the outside, whether it be money for winning a race that we, that we need, social recognition for winning a race, performing really well, looking really good on an Instagram post or whatever it might be, um, or selections for, for teams, for age group teams and so forth. And they're often placed on us by other people. So we might think, oh, I've got to perform for so-and-so, but it's the, their expectation of us that is letting us drive sort of the motivations. Um, you know, driving for a team, there's a, a recognition that we're seeking from our peers, which is the motivation. It's not actually us wanting to, to do well. We're wanting to do well because we think we're going to be liked more for doing so. So uh, extrinsic motivations can really kind of take away the enjoyment factor of the sport or our goal. Intrinsic motivators, on the other hand, are basically what, guides our behaviour based on our internal rewards. So our personal satisfaction and our self-esteem and so forth is what we're looking for to, to grow and to, to recognise in ourselves when we perform well or achieve a goal. And so these types of uh, motivations are often a lot more rewarding. Um, we have a lot more uh, enjoyable, uh, we enjoy them a lot more and we are likely to continue on, we are likely to do better than some of those in extrinsic motivations. So an example to kind of highlight the differences here is thinking back to like a gym selfie. So, you know, you scroll through Instagram, one of your mates has put up a, a selfie of him at, um, in the gym. Now, taking the photo, putting it on Instagram for the sake of getting likes and getting comments about how good someone looks is a, a very much that extrinsic side of things. <clears throat> if, however, you, you go to the gym, you don't take a photo, but you're working away trying to get your PB on a squat um, that is more of an intrinsic motivation because you're doing it for yourself. You're not seeking the, the clarification from others or the reward from others. 
um, for, uh, for the sake of your enjoyment. So the same goal uh, can have intrinsic and extrinsic motivations attached to it, um, and that's fine. It's generally normal um, to, to have both influences, but as long as you can try and get on top of those intrinsic side of things, so internally your motivations are bigger than the external side of things, then you're more likely to be successful. Um, and that is because at some point in the journey, as this quote talked about at the top, things are going to get tough. You know, maybe it's dark and it's cold outside and you've got to go for a, a run or a bike. Um, maybe you've got to get to the swimming pool and it's icy outside or you've got to drive down to the, the harbour or the lake to get in your kayak and, you know, part of the edge of the lake's frozen over. If your motivation for doing your activity and achieving your goal is high enough internally, that won't matter. You'll get up, you'll go do it. If you're driving to that external side of things, then it's, it's going to be a lot harder to drag yourself out of bed and get down to wherever you need to be. And I really think this is in, intrinsic motivations are coming from the heart. They're really something that we buy into, and that drives that ability to kind of push through the tough moments in, in training or racing. Um, you know, how often do you see people pull out of a race and they're just, just not into it? Um, you know, the, the satisfaction, the enjoyment is gone, and they can't even finish a race that they set out to achieve as a goal. And so that often screams to me that the motivation there wasn't right. And I've been in this situation before, um, and I'm, a lot of athletes have, because you just don't quite get the motivation right. You've either picked a goal because your friends were doing such a race, and, oh, okay, I'll tag along and go do that. And therefore, when the going gets tough, you can't push through the barrier um, and carry on. So it's all about what is fueling your inner fire uh, to perform, to achieve the goal, um, and once you've got your motivation sorted, it's really easy to then go in and set a goal and work towards it. So I'll kind of use that as a, a segue to, to, to looking around different sort of, I guess, about setting goals. Um, and often people have probably heard about SMART goals. I like using an acronym SMARTER goals. And I'm sure some of you have probably come across that as well. But essentially they're the same definition as, as SMART. So they're specific, they're measurable, achievable relevant, time-limited, but they're also exciting and they're recorded, which is the extra ER on the end. So I'm just going to briefly skip through each of those wee points uh, around how to make your goals smarter uh, and then throw out a, a challenge to you guys. So being specific, the more specific you can make a goal, the more likely you are to achieve it. So that would be maybe your, your goal is to run the, the half marathon in Auckland. So your goal becomes to run, let's say, 145 in the Auckland Half Marathon in 2020. Now, making the goal as specific as, as something like that is quite easy. It's easy to say, okay, I'm going to do this race, this event, whatever it might be, and do it at this time. Um, and so that's the easy part of the goal. And part of that, you've got to make it measurable. So how are you measuring your success or your failure? So in the case of the Half Marathon, it's easy. The time, 145. Now... <clears throat> The thing that often I find people sometimes struggle with in this section is they think, okay, my goal is just to finish. You know, I'm going to do the coast-to-coast two-day for the first time. I just want to finish. And so I often like to say, well, put, put a, still put a time in there somewhere. So what's the cutoff for the race? So let's call it 10 hours for day one. Uh, now, make the goal, I want to finish day one of the coast-to-coast two-day event in 10 hours. Or you break it into the individual legs if you need to. But therefore, they've still got a, a measurable achievement. Okay, my goal was 10 hours. I've come in at 9.50. I win. Or I've come in at 10.10, uh, 10, 10 hours, 10 minutes. I haven't, haven't succeeded. So I still like to add some sort of measurable component in there. You know, if your goal's around weight loss, have a, I want to lose 4 kgs or 5 kgs uh, in there as well. So you've got some sort of marker point. It's got to be achievable. So for me... To set a goal to say I want to achieve the coast to coast one day and be the winner in two years' time is probably unreal, un, unachievable because I've never kayaked before and I haven't done the two day coast to coast. So a more realistic goal might be okay, I want to achieve the coast to coast two day um, in, a, in a year's time. Um, this isn't me nominating myself to do the coast to coast just <laughs> to throw it out there before uh, too many people hit me up. But it's the same thing if you haven't run a half marathon before you're unlikely going to set yourself a goal of running one twenty half marathon as your first one, especially if your 10K time is 50 minutes. So make sure you make that a challenge. So you push yourself, 
to a new limit, but don't make it unrealistic in the, recent, uh, in the sense that you're setting yourself up to fail, especially if your life situations don't allow you to actually train uh, enough to set a 120 half marathon time. In terms of relevant, this is kind of where the intrinsic motivation comes in. So if your coach sets you this goal, it automatically becomes irrelevant to you because you haven't set it yourself. Now you could achieve or get to the same outcome as a goal, but you need to be the one that sets your goal to then go back to your coach and say, this is my goal, how do we get there? They may be able to help you make it a little bit more uh, realistic, but the relevance needs to come from you, needs to come from inside, because that's what's going to get you out of bed, as we said before, to, to train each day and to go through the race, push through those hard moments. Mm -hmm. Time limited. Um, it's basically just saying, okay, when is this goal going to be achieved? So probably the easiest example of that is, is someone saying, I want to lose 4 kgs in six months, not just saying I want to lose 4 kgs, because you might lose 4 kgs over the next 10 years, but you might then put on 2 kgs in the next six months and then lose 4 kgs. So give yourself a, a time period so you know what you're working with and you can put some plans into place around that. We're then looking at excited or exciting, and it's kind of similar to the relevance, but it's got to be something that, again, that's going to fuel your fire. So you might say, okay, I've got a couple of mates going to do a race, and I'm going to go with them, and I'm going to set this goal. So it becomes relevant to you because you've set it, but it doesn't excite you versus saying, okay, oh, this race or this event, I'm going to go do that, or I'm going to achieve this in my, my team um, in the, the new year. It's got to be something that's really getting you fired up and really going to make you want to achieve and want to, to pursue it, in the, especially when those times are getting tough. And then make sure you write it down. So that's the recorded part. If you don't write a goal down, it's very easy to keep it changing in your mind. Uh, it doesn't make it actually accountable for anything. So stick it to the fridge, uh, put it on your phone screensaver, stick it to the back of the toilet door, wherever you need to have it so you see it. So when you are having a bit of a down day, it is a bit of a struggle, you can look at that, okay, right, this is my goal, this is why I'm doing it, and you, you go out and do what you need to do. So to, to kind of end on the, a challenge, and again, as like I said last time, what are your intrinsic motivations? What motivates you to do the sport that you do? Write them down. Uh, put them on a piece of paper. Keep flicking through them every now and then, and you might, it might change over time. It's, it's bound to change over time. But whatever is fueling your fire, have it on a piece of paper so you're held accountable for them. But also set yourself a smarter goal. If you've got a goal currently you're working towards and it's missing a couple of those key points, sort of complete the picture and, and write it down, put it somewhere safe for yourself um, and get on to, um, towards working towards it. Matty? Mm, fantastic. I think, um, like, for, for me, I put huge amount of emphasis on the the relevance and the excitement factor for for the sort of goals that I set myself in, in terms of events. And for me, I used to always have to have an event, like what was next? Like I'd have, you know, my whole calendar lined up for the year. This is this is the, the events that I'm going to do. And it was almost every, you know, every weekend almost. But now I pretty much do one or two sort of significant events a year. And... I don't necessarily go out looking for them. I find that they kind of find me, and I know when I've found an event to do because I can't stop thinking about it. All I can do is, you know, I'm planning for it, um, you know, writing my training program. It's just everything that becomes, you know, the thing to focus on. Getting up out of bed at 3 o'clock in the morning to go for a ride, it's not even a, a factor because... Uh, essentially there's no other option. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's this is happening because I, I want to do it so much. I'm not even setting the alarm clock to get up because, mm -hmm. you know, I'm excited to do it. My body's like, let's go, let's go. Um, on the complete opposite, if I don't have a goal, then my motivation is so low. I really, I find that I really need to get that nailed down. I'm such a goal orientated person. If I don't have a goal set for me, um, I I can't do you know very good work at all. Uh, you know, in life in general, but also you know in sport as we're talking about. Mm. Well, I mean, I think if there's no 
there's no goal set down for specific areas. There's no end point. Mm. You know, again, uh, the gym setting is quite an easy one to look at. Okay, I want to, you know, I'm going to the gym, I'm squatting, I'm deadlifting, bench pressing, whatever I'm doing. But for what? Am I just getting yep. stronger and stronger? I can't keep getting stronger all the time. That has to come to an end point. But if I'm working to increase my, my 1RM, then, okay, I've always got a measurable a number. Okay, I've hit that, I haven't hit this. What I restructure the program a little bit and carry on. So yep. it's, it's good for, for keeping end points and, and actually giving you some sort of accountability. Yeah, absolutely. So with in our series, our mindset series, what do we have coming up next episode, Nick? Next is all about reflection. Uh, so I think this is going to be quite an interesting area, especially on the back of setting goals. Once you've achieved or, or not achieved a goal, then what? How do you mm. how do you use that going forward? Um, and, and how do we use reflection, I guess, in a daily sort of setting to, to keep our mindset in a positive manner uh, and to keep learning, keep growing um, as individuals? Fantastic. We look forward to hearing about that in the next episode. All right, team, we're going to jump into training plan sneak peek. If you weren't aware, over at exponentialperformancecoaching.com, we have a tab that has a whole bunch of uh, generic training plans on there. They are for a whole bunch of different uh, events or different goals in in mind. Uh, And what we're going to do is in each episode, we're going to have a little bit more of an inside look into those training plans, uh, see what they're all about, and see who they might be able to help. In this episode, we're going to be having a look at the mountain bike enduro training plan. I designed this training plan uh, for mountain bike enduro riders after having a massive amount of people contact me asking me, one, how to train for mountain bike enduro, but then sort of saying, well, a traditional training plan doesn't really fit the average mountain bike enduro rider. So a mountain bike enduro rider is a sort of a bit of a special uh, sort of beast, I guess, in that they love to ride. Uh, They love to ride with their mates. And most of all, they love to beat their mates. And I guess the only thing that probably trumps that is they hate structured training. But So there's all these people that want to get better, but they don't really want to train to get better. They just want to go out and ride and have fun. So my fix to that or my uh, solution to that was to design a short training program. So this, the enduro training plan is only six weeks long with the idea that most enduro riders coming into it already have a pretty good base fitness because they live on their bikes. They just love getting out there and riding on the trails and having fun. So they've already got a pretty good aerobic base. What they need to do and what's going to make the biggest difference in their performance is just a little bit of sharpening of that top end speed and power for them. So this plan is all about six weeks of focused training, working on developing that top end through primarily interval training. So it's sort of the idea of uh, picking the low-hanging fruit so that you can get your performance or your race performance as high as possible in the shortest period of time doing the minimal amount of work so that on race day you can go out there and sort of perform better enjoy yourself a little bit more because you're pushing harder and hopefully rip the legs off your mates as well which is the most important thing just a little bit of a feedback from uh, a a rider that was on the program and you can find this over on the exponential performance coaching website under the training plans tabs but it says I've noticed two things with the enduro training plan. Firstly is how quickly you can gain strength and fitness. But because I have been through the plan twice over a period of six months, the extra fitness has allowed me to concentrate more when descending and I've made a lot of gains with my skills. I feel comfortable riding at speeds that used to push my limits because they're fitter. So this person, you can see that they've sort of used it as a little bit of a 
uh, a little bit of a top up between or four key events coming up over a six month period. They've had a couple of events that they want to perform well at. So they've slotted the six week training plan in leading up to those so that they can sharpen their, uh, their speed and power up leading into it. This plan is run through Training Peaks, so it's an online platform. You get a free Training Peaks basic account with it, have the app on your phone, uh, and it has everything that you need to know about it. So if you think you would like to take a little bit more of a look at the Enduro Training Plan, find it over at exponentialperformancecoaching.com slash Enduro Training Plan. If you're having a look through the training plans over on the website, and you cannot find something that suits your needs or your wants, drop us a line and let us know what you're after and we'll see what we can come up with to help you out with your training. The training plans are a great way to get structured, sort of scientific-based training without the price tag that comes with the, the personalized training that Nick and I also offer. That's the training plan sneak peek for this episode. And we'll be looking at a different training plan next time. We're going to kick in for our final segment of this episode with Nick and his quick tip. Vitamin D. So what is vitamin D? Vitamin D is one of the 24 micronutrients that is critical for human survival. So without it, we, we, we can't survive. The sun is probably our biggest source of vitamin D, and hopefully all of you know that, that getting sun exposure on the skin um, in small amounts, um, and certainly not advocating for, for baking yourself in the sun unprotected, you can't get vitamin D with sunscreen on. So sunscreen blocks the absorption of vitamin D because we absorb it through our skin, and then it's in sort of synthesized in the body using cholesterol under the skin. We also go get some vitamin D found in, in fish and eggs and some dairy products, it's added to it as well. Vitamin D, however, comes from the sun when it's in the kind of the UV3 or UV index 3 or above. So a lot of the, the countries below the equator, uh, especially in New Zealand during winter time, we might think we're getting really good sun exposure because we're outside a bit more, the sun's really nice, but we're not getting the same vitamin D levels that we would during summertime. So what this means is we can end up just being low in vitamin D, uh, certainly not talking deficiency, but just being low. And what low vitamin D can cause is just a bit of a slump in the mood. So think about the a nice, bright, sunny day. You're outside, you're feeling really happy. Everyone around you tends to be a little bit happier as well. And then you get a couple of days of rain and people kind of get a bit, a bit grouchy and a bit grumpy couple of sunny days and people get a bit happier again. So it's kind of that, that sunshine effect essentially that we can use by supplementing with vitamin D, especially through the winter time um, and especially in, in sort of colder, um, more southern regions of the world. So in New Zealand, we can only recommend a thousand international units, which is how they measure vitamin D uh, per day. In America, they, they use upwards of, of sort of 10,000 international units. So somewhere in the, in the middle. Um, the, the problem with taking high dose vitamin D is you need a few other nutrients to absorb it a bit better, namely vitamin K, um, that can really help the absorption of vitamin D. So both of them are fat soluble vitamins and the body will store some of them, unlike your, your B vitamins and vitamin C where they're water soluble so the body excretes them qu quite quickly. So the other area apart from helping to increase our mood that's really important for vitamin D is, is especially for female athletes it's around the density of their bones and the minerals in those bones because vitamin D is essential for calcium absorption into the bones so without decent levels of vitamin D we're not absorbing calcium enough uh, there is potential for calcium to end up in the in the blood which is not ideal but also we ends up with with decreasing our uh, bone density increasing our chance of, of fractures and, and breaks um, later in life and that's really important for sort of puberty aged girls but then also menopausal age females um, you want to maximize at the, the younger end of the spectrum to prevent later on in life so simply by taking a vitamin d supplement or maybe increasing your consumption of fish and eggs through winter time 
uh, can be a really good option just to keep your levels a little bit higher, so therefore you're less likely to have that kind of low mood associated with a, a low vitamin D. Fantastic. Quick tip for this week. Done. Just remember, if you want to help shape the future of the Exponential Performance Podcast, send us in a question. Send us in a question through uh, the voice message system we have set up over at exponentialperformancecoaching.com slash ask. Send that through and we will do our best to answer it. If you don't want to have your voice on the podcast, feel free to send us through a question via email or over on social media as well. For any of the resources that we mentioned on today's episode of the podcast, they will be over at exponentialperformancecoaching.com slash 66. Make sure you don't miss out on any of the upcoming podcasts or videos by subscribing to our YouTube channel. If you didn't know, there is a video version of this podcast with our ugly mugs on it over on YouTube if you want to check that out. Some people said it was frightening seeing our faces. Other people said it was nice. Who knows which one (laughs) you will decide on. Anyway, check that out over at YouTube. There's also a bunch of other videos on that channel as well, especially people enjoy the Whiteboard Wednesday sessions. So have a look at those if you have not done so already. Come on over and join us at Exponential Performance Coaching over on Facebook where we post a bunch of stuff over there or on Instagram to continue the conversation. I'm at Matty EPC and Nick is at it's underscore a uh, underscore nicks underscore life. And you can also check out the Harden Up Instagram over at Harden Up Inc. Until next time, get out there and train hard. Use this information though to train a little bit smarter. Mate, thanks for listening. If you would like to support this podcast and see it continue into the future, you can do so in a number of ways. Firstly, make sure you subscribe to this channel on whatever platform you are listening. Like and share the podcast on social media to help spread the word. If you're feeling really generous, head over and leave a review and a rating over on iTunes. This helps spread the word and develop the podcast. All of this will help the podcast continue long into the future so we can keep bringing you the information you need to train hard, but most importantly, train smart. We'll talk to you next week.